Hi, friends. Welcome back. Long time no podcast. I hope that you are doing well and having a wonderful day, night, whatever time it is where you are. I am popping in with an unconventional episode. If you've been a longtime listener of the pod, you know that I usually have a guest on or I have a solo episode. And today is a solo episode, but it's really a life update episode where I'm not only updating you on what's going on in my life right now, but how I've been thinking about things for the last several years, what I've been navigating and negotiating and just kind of bringing you in and updating you on all of the ups and downs, ins and outs of my journey in the last few years from Seattle to Mexico to Thailand to Rwanda to Los Angeles, medical emergency surgery back to Seattle, and then what I'm doing moving forward. This is probably my most vulnerable and transparent episode other than The Naked Files, if you caught that series that I did when I was living in Rwanda. I really wanted to share this with you because it feels like a very important perspective into my life. I feel like a lot has shifted since I started Black Girl Mystic Podcast Portal in the Panini Press. And I appreciate if you were with us on that journey many years ago. It's been such a wild ride. And as we are all recalibrating to new evolutions of ourselves and our world and our own relationship to source and spirit and ourselves, I wanted to just pop in and give you a really transparent and honest and vulnerable conversation about what's going on in my world. So I hope that you enjoy it. I hope that it resonates with you in a deep way and that as you learn more about me and my path, maybe it sparks something also for you and your path. Before I dive in and share the episode with you, I wanted to just invite you to check out a couple of different ways that we can work together. If you're interested in working with me one-on-one in private mentorship, you can check out L the Goddess, L the letter, lthegoddess.com and see what's going on over there. And if you're into human design and you know that you are a human design projector, you can check out successlovesprojectors.com successlovesprojectors.com, which is where I am offering my personal offerings for projectors to help you live lives of abundance and success and joy and fulfillment and all that jazz. So without further ado, thank you for sticking with me all this time. I'm very honored to be back in this way and we'll be back in the future with other conversations and new and evolving ways That sounds very mysterious, doesn't it? And if you just want to say hi and catch up, feel free to send me a message on Instagram at l.the.goddess underscore. That's l.the.goddess underscore on Instagram. Say hi and we can catch up over there. Hi, friends. Today, I want to just have a conversation with you, giving you a life and times update because a lot is shifting behind the scenes over here for me. And I feel like the things I'm learning, the things I'm recognizing about myself and my life and my path and my journey might also be beneficial for you if they resonate at all with your life and your path and your journey. So here's the deal. I've been back in Seattle. This is September 4th, 2024. I've been back in Seattle now for months. If you're not familiar with this journey, that may not be significant to you at all. So let me give a background story. Hi, my name is Laren Alta, also known as L, And I was born and raised in Seattle, Washington. I love being from Seattle. I spent my formative years here, zero to 18. And then I moved to Atlanta to go to Spelman College. And it was at that point that I had my first bout of depression and also realized I did not want to be in college. I did not want to be in Atlanta. I wanted to be out and about traveling the world. So after I told my mother that, after my first year, I told her I wanted to take a year off. And my mother said to me, what does that mean? We don't do that in this family. Now, for a little bit of backstory, at the time, I was the fourth generation in my family to go to college. And this is only my maternal side because I don't know nothing about my maternal side. Great grandparents, both my great grandfather and grandmother had undergraduate and graduate degrees. My great grandfather had two undergraduate degrees 
and two master's degrees, and he graduated from Cornell University with one of those masters, and he was born just a few years after enslavement ended. So, of course, I come from one of those talented, tenth Black, bougie families who understand the value and the power of education because it's literally what gave us freedom and power to move out of the severe oppression that my family comes from in the segregated South. And so not only did my great-grandparents both have undergraduate and graduate degrees, my grandparents also had undergraduate and graduate degrees, as well as my father and my mother. Now, that's just my direct lineage, right? So, of course, I have cousins and uncles and everybody else went to college, went to grad school and all that jazz. So when I told my mother after my sophomore year at Spelman that I wanted to take a year off to travel the world and go to India, when she said, I don't know what that means. We don't do that in this family. She was being 100% literal. <laughs> Nobody in my family who had gone to college had also then taken a year off to do anything, not to mention travel. So I went back to Spelman and I was miserable. I did not want to be there. And I hit a wall and I was severely depressed, so depressed that I could not get out of bed. I could not function. And if it hadn't been for my boyfriend at the time, who actually we had been together since high school, we went to high school together. He ended up going to Morehouse. I ended up going to Spelman. If, he, if it wasn't for, I don't know how I would have made it. I always say he saved my life. I wouldn't have known how to function had he not been there. So I went back, trudged through very miserably through my sophomore year. And at the end of my sophomore year, I had a dear friend of mine pass away. Multiple friends actually passed away in very surprising and unforeseen circumstances. And I told my mother, I don't care what we do in this family. I'm taking the next year off. And I did. I left Atlanta. I came back to Seattle and I got my dream job working at the Nordstrom Mac counter. I saved my money and I bought a round the world ticket from Seattle to Bangkok, Thailand, to Nepal, to India. And then I went to France. And this was by myself at 20 years old. So that has always been my spirit, right? That has always been in my power. That's always been in my joy. That's always been in my passion. That's always been in my vision for my life. And myself is to be a world traveler. That's all I actually really wanted to do. I was just in college because it was expected of me. There, I didn't really have an option, even though there was a moment in high school where I wanted to take a year off between high school and college. But I was just so caught up in the momentum of going to college that I didn't really slow down to be like, is this what I really want? Because almost all of my friends were going to college. And so there wasn't even a time for me to be like, is this what I want? Is this for me? No, I just did it because... Applied early admission to Spelman, which means once you get accepted, you are committed to Spelman. It was the only college I wanted to go to. It was the only college I applied to. And when I got in, I, I was set, right? So I was like excited and graduating and moving on and all that jazz. So that's in my blood. And I come from a family of travelers. My mother has been all around the world. Even before I was born, she had gone to Ghana in the 70s with my father. My grandmother, who was born in the 20s, had gone to Asia in the 70s. My uncles have our world. So I come from world travelers. So it wasn't a big deal that I wanted to travel. It was a big deal that I didn't want to be in college. I ended up going back to Spelman and finishing eventually graduating eight years after my incoming class. I did it more out of obligation and so that I could actually have a degree versus actually being thrilled about college. And now that at this big age, I recognize, oh, I'm neurospicy. Oh, I'm neurodivergent. That's also probably why college was grueling to me, why all this, I don't do well in institutional learning. These kinds of things don't work well for me. But we didn't know that then. And I didn't even know how to think about it then. And now I have more context and greater understanding for how my brain actually works. But at the time, I did not. In my adult life, I have been all over the world. I've been to 24 countries. I've lived in multiple countries. I've been to every continent except Antarctica. And more than anything, the life on the road, traveling internationally, meeting new people, making new friends, that nomadic life, eating food, eating street. I love street food. I love cuisine from all different kinds of corners of the globe. That feels more like home to me than being stationary and trying to figure out how to have a sedentary, stationary, standard life. That has never excited me. That has never resonated with me. But of course, the narrative for that is so much more dominant than live your dreams, chart your own course, follow your own North Star, right? And so fast forward, I had a terrible shaking, foundation shaking 
relationship that completely turned my life upside down and inside out that ended in 2018. And to heal and recover from that, I went to a small little pueblo on the beach in Mexico and basically healed and recovered there for the first just five months because the relationship wasn't insane. I was in a relationship with someone who didn't exist. So I didn't know that the relationship was insane until it ended. And then the reality hit the fan over a course of several months when I realized that the nothing I knew about the person that I was not only in romantic relationship with for three and a half years, but had been cohabitating with was a figment of their own imagination, was not a real person in the sense that everything was a lie. (laughs) And so when I learned this at the end of our relationship, and I was gradually introduced to the reality of who I was in a relationship with and the lie that I had been unknowingly in for three and a half years, my whole sense of reality and trust in the world shattered, crumbled, fell to the ground. And so I went to Mexico where I gradually started putting my psyche back together. And Mexico was the place that I started to really heal, which was very challenging and very difficult, but it was really starting to put my life together brick by brick. Then I came back to the States and stayed for a little smidge. Then I moved to Thailand and I lived in Chiang Mai for six months. Did I love Chiang Mai? But did it feel great to be out of the country again? Yes. I learned a lot about what I need from a country, what I want from a city and all that jazz. So then I came back to the States. Then I moved back to Mexico to the same Pueblo that I had been in before, same everything, and stayed there for eight months. I loved living in Mexico. I loved living in a sweet little apartment on the beach. It was marvelous. And then March 2020 came. And we all know what happened in March 2020. So then I came back to the States. And one of my Spelman sisters let me live in her house while she was in D.C. for five months. And then I went back to Seattle. Now, by the time I came back to Seattle, it was the beginning of fall, similar to how it is now. And I knew that I could not do another Seattle winter. It's cold, it's gray, it's wet, and I cannot stand it. It is not how I'm made to live. It's not how I'm here to be. And so I started plotting and planning and figuring out where I could go next, who was navigating the pandemic in a way that was intentional and deliberate and loving and thoughtful for its citizens. We know that was not the United States of America. Okay, we know that's the truth. But who was doing it? And so I started learning more about Rwanda and what was going on in Rwanda. And someone that I had been in Chiang Mai with at the same time, another Black American woman, was living in Rwanda, in Kigali, Rwanda. And so we had several conversations about what it was like living in Rwanda, how things were happening. And I was like, I'm going to Rwanda. They were taking incredible care of their citizens, incredible care. And I said, okay. And because they were so regulated. So I applied for and got a 10-year visa. And my plan at this point was that once I was in Rwanda, I had no plans to come back right? I had no plans. I went first to visit to see if I liked it. and went, took a little side trip to Zanzibar, loved it, thought it was amazing, came back and realized it was time to go, right? So when I went back to Rwanda, I got a 10-year visa. I had no plans to come back to the United States whatsoever. I was happy as a lark. They were taking care of their citizens with really thoughtful COVID precautions, really thoughtful, deliberate ways of making sure people stayed healthy and alive, even if they were considered strict by other considerations. I liked feeling safer there. And when I lived there, it was clean. It was safe. It was quiet. It was beautiful. It was green. I was like, every Black American needs to come to Rwanda just to reset their nervous system, just to feel What does it feel like to be somewhere that actually feels safe, where you're not worried about the police or your life or being in danger, right? Like at least for a couple of weeks, just to feel what that feels like. Now, the challenging part of being Rwanda is I was incredibly lonely. I was incredibly isolated. I did not have a social community. I did not have a social network. I did not feel connected to people. That was very difficult. And when I travel, I like to 
be friends with and have community with the people who are actually from the places that I'm traveling. That feels really important to me. But while Rwanda was clean, it was safe, it was green, all these things, actually interpersonally, they're still very much recovering from the Tutsi genocide that was in 1990. Almost everybody who lives there has a genocide story, even if they hadn't been born yet, even if they weren't in country when it happened. And unlike the United States, where we don't talk about our deep traumas and deep pains as a country, they talk about it. It is out in the open. It's not a shame. It's not taboo. It's just part of everyday life. And so while I was there, so many of my needs were being met. The weather, the sunshine, being surrounded by Black people. I loved so many things about it. It was clean. It was safe. It was green. I loved it. But I was isolated and alone. I had a huge four-bedroom, five-bathroom house. So I had daily support. Being Lydia, who was just an angel in my life, cooked me three meals a day from scratch, six days a week, went to the market for me, walked my dog every day, and cleaned the house top to bottom, including the floors, six days a week. She did my laundry, everything. Like it was the most amazing way to be supported. It was such a gift. I'm so grateful for Lydia forever and ever. And I did go to her church. I did meet some of her family. Like she invited me to a Rwandan wedding. That felt very wonderful and connected, but she was my only kind of entree into the culture and I didn't really have community there. Fast forward, I get incredibly ill, so ill that I can't walk up the stairs without collapsing. It was just very severe. I was in the hospital multiple times in Rwanda. And finally, I had to draw the line in the sand and decide to come back to the States to get medical attention, like actual medical attention, not an emergency hospital run. And so I just had to do it. There was no way I was going to sustain myself. There was no way I was going to survive any further in Rwanda because I needed medical care. And because I don't have a family support system, I'm an orphan of estrangement in my family. And so because I don't have a family support system, I had to create a GoFundMe. And the GoFundMe is what got me back to the States, got me the support I needed so that I could have the surgery and stay in a nice place and get the care that I needed to recover. And I did it. So that's what brought me back from Rwanda. Yes, I was lonely and isolated, but I really was dying. That's what was happening. I was actually dying. And so when I came back to the States, it wasn't because I was like thinking that was, it wasn't a plan, but I needed to stay alive. I needed to save my life. And so I came back to the States. I was in Los Angeles for eight months and had surgery and came back to Seattle the beginning of August 2023. And so I've been back in Seattle for 13 months and What I realized very recently is that because I've been here and I didn't want to be here and winter is so hard for me and the darkness is so hard for me in the winter when it gets dark at four o'clock, three o'clock, and it doesn't get light until nine o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning the next day. It's so much darkness. It's so wet. It's so gray. It's a completely different way than how I actually thrive. I thrive in sunshine. I thrive in warmth. I thrive in outside culture where people are warm and friendly and invitational. And Seattle is just not that. And so this last year was so hard for me because I'm here and didn't want to be, didn't plan on being, was making the most and the best as I could. But after that GoFundMe and all my medical care and all that, I didn't have no money. I didn't have any money. I was just trying to live. And so this last year has been deliberately step-by-step, pace-by-pace, putting the foundation beneath my feet so that I could be able to make other choices. And I kept having this conversation with myself. was, oh, I don't want to be here in Seattle. Oh, I don't want to be here in Seattle. And that's true. It took me a long time to like, for it to be clear to me. But what I finally got yesterday was... I had never planned on being in Seattle. Like me not liking to be in Seattle during the fall and the winter and the spring is not new information. That's why I planned to be gone. That's why I have a 10-year visa to Rwanda. That's why I've lived in Thailand and Mexico and all over the world, right? Because I had no plans on being here. It's just that I have a home here. I have an apartment here. And so I can return here. But being here for a year was never in my plan was never something I thought I was going to do, never something I intended to do. And so that gives me a greater sense of, yeah, Laren, 
it's okay to go. I always knew it was okay to go, but it's really like, you're in a different timeline. Like you had already set, I had already set everything up to be on a different timeline in a different place. And then I reverted back to this timeline for health and safety and being to stay alive. But now that all of those things are in place, it's time for me to go and get back on the timeline that I actually intend for myself and actually set up for myself. And so I'm not really clear yet where I'm going to go. That's not decided or determined yet. I just know that I got to get back in the groove that feels good to me. And there are certain parts of the world that are calling my name. But really, what the pieces that I made is that I'm nomadic. I love having a home base, but I don't need my home base to be Seattle 365 days a year. It can be in other parts of the world. I can have multiple home bases. And so that has given me so much peace. And so going back to that part of me that when I left the country for the first time in the eighth grade, I was like, yes, this is me out and about in the world, meeting new people, making new friends, eating delicious food. Food is a through line. I am a Taurus. These are important things for me, right? These are not just arbitrary nice to haves. They are also need to haves for me. And the more that I embrace and accept that I am neurospicy, the more that I recognize that my brain doesn't work like other people's brains work, the more that I give myself permission to really follow and do and honor and center what works for me above and beyond all else. Now, I have always done that, right? But but what I need has evolved, right? Without a support system, without a family support system, it's like a double-edged sword. On one hand, it gives me more permission to go and do the things that light me up and fill up my soul and like really bring me joy. And at the same time, it's challenging to do that without a support system. It's challenging to do that without a safety net, whether financial or familial. It's almost, humans are designed to be in community. And so the piece that I've come to is that I have to create my community. I have to find my community. And the way I want to live in my life, the way I want to experience life is not in this kind of normative standard traditional way of being. The the ways that we find security and connection and safety nets, I don't have a lot of those in my life, right? I'm not close to my family. I'm not partnered yet, right? I don't have children. I don't have colleagues. I work for myself. I don't have organized religion. And I live in a, I'm from a culture, United States, that's hyper individualistic, hyper independent oriented, right? And so it's not even like communal centered or communal based or communally organized. And so I want to be somewhere that's more people centered, that's more connected, that values other human beings baked into the culture. That's what feels good to me. That's what feels like home to me. And I loved when I was in LA, for example, I loved being in LA. I would have stayed in LA, but I didn't have LA money that was sustainable. And I don't want to be in LA homeless or hungry. That doesn't sound fun to me. And so I'm at peace now with, I got to go somewhere in the world that allows me to have the lifestyle that feels like home to me, the community and the cultures that feel like home to me, period, Pooh. That's it. And so I'm thinking of certain places that I want to go. I've lived all over the world. I've lived in Paris. I've lived in Africa. I've lived in Mexico. I've lived in Asia. I've lived all over. And I've traveled even more places than I've lived. There are some places that really resonate with me and some places that don't as much. But what I realize is that I don't have to be stationary, that I can stop trying to fit a round peg into a square whole by trying to find my one forever home. Maybe I'll find it and maybe I won't. And that's okay too. That's okay too. But I do know that my home base doesn't need to be here. I think I'll keep my place in Seattle for the time being as I keep exploring and adventuring all over the world. And when it's time to let it go, I will. But until then, I'm creating new homes and new places based on my life experience and my journey thus far. So that's my update. And I'm not quite sure where I'm going to go or when I'm going to leave, but I am excited to know that it will be somewhere else and it will be soon because I've given myself a date by which I need to buy my plane ticket. And once I have my plane ticket 
And once I have where I'm going to be going secured, I'll let y'all know. But until then, I just want to remind you that you have permission to live your life your own way and on your own terms. And I think as we get older, we can sometimes think that we have to start conforming more. If we've seen our friends or our peers or our colleagues create quote unquote success by following a traditional template. And if you know that's not the way you are meant to live, that's not the life you're here for, then you've got to trust that. You've got to honor that. You've got to live in that. And once I realized, again, once I realized that I feel out of place because I had set my entire life up to be living somewhere else on a completely different continent, it freed me up from trying to make this work. I'm just in a different timeline and I need to jump back into the timeline that I set up for myself that actually resonates with me because I trust myself above and beyond everyone and everything else. I trust myself. I trust my wisdom. I trust my truth. I trust my divinity. I trust my sovereignty. I trust my power. I trust my purpose. I trust my ability to live and be prosperous. I trust that. I trust the divine in me, as me, and moving through me that's leading and guiding my life and protecting me from harm. I trust that above and beyond all else. And that's what matters because I would die in a corporation. I would die in an institution. I would die working for someone, like internally die. And uh, that's not how I'm here to live my life. And so trusting that, honoring that, following that is what my true purpose is. And I don't know what the road has ahead of me. I have desires. I have dreams. I have visions. But I know they're not for me here because I'm on a misaligned timeline. And so it's time to jump back onto the timeline that is mine, where I flourish and thrive. And that's what I'm doing now. So thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being part of this conversation. I'm deeply honored and I will keep you updated and post it as the journey continues. If you have any interest in working with me, you can check out lthegoddess.com where I'm offering one-on-one -on -one mentorships and and if you're a human design projector and you're interested in learning more about yourself as a projector, check out successlovesprojectors.com. In the meantime and in between time, I'll keep posted on all of my adventures. Take care. Bye for now. <music>